So our next speaker is going to be Jorge Marin. Jorge is an engineer passionate about robotics, automation, statistics, and mountains. When asked to describe himself in five words, he went with dedicated, procrastinative, perfectionist, forgetful, and approachable. Uh, Jorge is passionate about confronting the issues we all come up against in production and thrives in a culture that is both collaborative and delivery focused. Uh, this is his first time at BrizTech and his talk today is titled Testing in Production, Ideas, Experiences, Limits and Roadblocks. Please join me in welcoming Jorge. Thank you everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, yeah. good. Um, well, oh, hidden slide. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Thanks for coming to to Bridge Tech. Um, and, and thanks for choosing this talk over the other two. But I'm pretty sure the other two are way better than this one. But I'll try. Um, if you want to leave, now is the moment. Uh, if you want to stay, thank you. And I'll try. Uh, I hope you learn something new today. Um, yeah. So my name is Jorge. I'm an engineer. Uh, I come from Spain. Um, and I'm currently working at Dyson here, uh, five minutes walking from this door. Um, and, and yeah, I studied uh, telecommunications engineering uh, back in Spain and have been working uh, at Vinami for three years. It's a company that was recently acquired by VMware. Uh, so kudos to the team. And a year, a year and a half ago, I joined Dyson. Um, and yeah, here I am. Um, this talk is testing in production. I try to uh, uh, share my experiences about uh, testing in production, and uh, so you can apply them to your to your current positions or companies. Uh, good. Um, for time, uh, I would like you to raise your hands if you are having a good day. <laughs> amazing, amazing. This conference, amazing. Uh, often forget to squash a squash before merge. Anybody? <laughs> right. Know what testing is. Good. Yes. Thank you. Uh, know about the testing pyramid or any other way of classifying tests? Good. Have a production environment? <laughs> Everyone, yeah. Are testing your services in production? <laughs> Not so many. Uh, shy hands. <laughs> uh, good, thank you. Prefer spaces to tabs? <laughs> yeah, spaces for the win. Cool. Uh, <laughs> let, let's get into, into the topic. Um, what is this talk about? Um, I'm gonna try. Um, I'm not gonna uh, dig uh, into very technical details. Uh, this is mostly answer to frequent asked questions about testing and production services, um, and it's based on. It's mostly based on my experience working uh, here at Dyson. Um, so, the things I'm gonna I'm gonna answer are: Why do you need tests in production? In production. What is the right testing level against production systems? How can we define an end-to-end -end test? Um, how to keep your tests out of the business reports and the statistics? Um, and also regarding cleanup. Um, regarding cleanup. Should you clean up the, yourself? What happens if you don't when you run the test? Uh, yeah, so let's dive in. <laughs> first, uh, the first question was, why do you need testing in production? Well. What do you mean by testing in production first? Um, so what I mean personally about when talking about testing in production is to guarantee that your application, your service, or your Lambda function continues to work consist consistently after the release deployment, and it does what it's meant uh, to, to do um, over the course of, of all the time and space. Um, so yeah, you say, well, uh, but I have a uh, real-time dashboards uh, showing uh, the health of my service. Um, yeah, how many how many uh, successful requests, how many failed requests, and and everything. So actually, if I look at the dashboard, I know if the service is working or not. Well, you sure? <laughs> I'm gonna put you an example, um, and I hope uh, it's easy to to follow. Um, so imagine you have a Lambda function or yeah a service uh, with only one function that returns the current date, right? Um, you have written unit tests uh, so that when you call that function, it returns a string with the current date. Um, you also have integration tests. You're checking that the API is working fine, that when you're asking for the date, it returns a string and it returns the date. And you have manually tested because you went to the service and asked for the date and it returned the date. Um, you don't have any new versions because it's just returning a date. Um, 
So you just deploy, verify, and forget about the service for the rest of your life. You have dashboards, which are showing that the service is healthy, the service is answering, it's in AWS, at Google Cloud, Azure, whatever. And the metrics are healthy, and you are getting a lot of 200 OK. So the service seems to be working fine. But until the year 2038, <laughs> anyone knows what happens in 2038, roughly? Yeah. Right. So uh, for those of you who doesn't know, I don't know if, if you can see the slide uh, very good, but um, this is a problem when you store the uh, when you store a date in a signed 32 byte uh, binary uh, as a two uh, sorry as a signed 32 byte uh, bit uh, binary integer. Um, so what happens is that uh, when you when we store the date, um, this is the binary representation. So at the beginning of the epoch. Uh, which is the 1st of January 1970, uh, all are zeros. Then today, you can see zeros and ones. And then what happens in the year uh, 2038 is that we fill everything with ones except the first, uh, the first bit, which is the sign. And what happens the next second is that only that bit is turned to one and the other. Um, so you incre increase that number. Um, and the first bit becomes a one and the rest becomes zero. And that means that because it's assigned 32 bits integer, um, that's the value minus 21 million whatever, which represent the day, the, <laughs> the 13th of December, uh, 1901 or 1901, uh, which is just one day after Marconi uh, received the first transatlantic uh, radio signal. So. That's what's going to happen in the year 2038 if we don't store the dates in a 64-bit uh, variable, which hopefully you are already doing. Oh, not, not you, but all, all the systems and, and computers. Um, so yeah, this is an example where everything is working fine. All your tests, unit tests, integration tests, uh, dashboards, and, and health is fine. But then the users are going to experience an error, and all your production system are gonna crash. So uh, yeah, remember that. Um, yeah, so that was a simple example. Um, but just imagine that one of your stateful services becomes inconsistent and it starts failing for all the customers. Um, and this is a production system, remember. So um, if, you, if, if that service or Lambda or function or whatever is interconnected to the, to your, uh, to the rest of your services, um, basically the service you are providing to your customers is not going to work. So a lot of customers will call saying you that they cannot log in or they cannot register, change the profile picture or, or the chocolate milkshake. So now that's a problem. Um, so here we have two options. Uh, the first option is, well, if you don't have any automated testing in production, you have real angry paying customer calling you because what they pay for is not really working and all the systems are down. Or if you have tests in production that are run uh, every five minutes or every minute, every 20 minutes, you decide. Um, it's a process acting as a real user and it will notice that the service is not working or that uh, mm, the service you are providing to the customers is, is broken at, at the moment and will notify, will, will notify you right away. It will be like having the customer next to you in, 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 your, in your workplace and telling you, hey, this just became broken. Um, so that's more useful than having all, 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 every, all the customers calling you um, and, and filling uh, your customer lines. So once we have, um, once we have uh, seen the benefits of testing in production. Uh, we get into uh, uh, into detail later. Um, you might be wondering how can we test those services in production? Are, are they unit tests, or how how really uh, are we meant to to test that? So these are this is a test pyramid. Well, one of them um, where you have the unit test, the integration test, the UI or end-to-end -end test, or the manual testing, or Whatever. Um, but this is one one of the the test environments that I like the most. Um, in the uh, in the bottom, you have the unit test uh, where you test your functions. Then you have integration tests where you test uh, a whole service. 
uh, and then end-to-end -end test will be the tests that are checking um, the behavior of several services uh, as one entity. So for the unit test, again, you have function. For the integration test, is the minimum unit after deployment. So when you deploy a service, you do the integration test for that service, checking that it exposes the right APIs and you don't care how it works internally, you just care about the exposed API, APIs. And for the end-to-end -end is how all the services connected between them uh, work together. And that's what the user sees. So the user is gonna try to log in or is gonna try to change the profile picture. And that's, that's not involving just one service, but all the services that you have in production. And that's why I refer to when I talk about end-to-end -end tests. This is the minimum unit a user could see, uh, a user action or a user journey. Good, so how can really, um, exactly. Um, so can we, how can we define um, an end-to-end -end test? Uh, well, this is an example. Um, so at Dyson, we have uh, more than one million connected machines uh, performing automated actions like schedule clean every, every second. And, and users all over the world uh, making actions from the, from the smartphones, from the app in Android or, or iPhone. For example, renaming the cleaning robot from Dyson 350i to RoboMob 9000. Um, so as this is happening in production and we have a lot of users uh, using our services, uh, we want to define that this test should be fast, should be easy to run, um, and should focus on, on, on the behavior, should, should try to mimic what the users are, are doing so you can uh, find, find out what's the problem before they do. Um, and this is an example uh, using um, the framework, uh, or yeah, the framework of the library Cucumber.js. Um, so this is how you would define a, a, an end-to-end -end test that involves all the services that you have in production. Given an existing user with this configuration, and the user logs in, and the user changes uh, the robot name to RoboMob 9000, then the robot name has changed to RoboMob 9000. This is an example of an end-to-end -end test, and it involves uh, an existing user, so it involves that you have the user in your data databases. Um, the user logs in, so your login service should be working fine, and your database should be queryable. Um, then the user changes robot name, the service for changing the robot name should be working, and the backend for storing that new robot name should be working too, and then the robot name has changed. Then it receives the answer to the app, so you can see in the app your robot name has changed. So with this test, we are testing end-to-end -end a user journey, a user intent, a user action, and this is what it matters. Uh, and by the way, you have here a link to the 79 best robot vacuum names uh, you can use to, to rename your robot vacuum. Um, so it's a very simplified um, architecture um, where you have the real users, which are using the uh, smartphone apps to interact with the cloud, with our services in the cloud, and, and then you have the, the machines, the robot or the air purifier or whatever, and this is your production system, and this is where all your um, services are running in the cloud. So we define the amaz amazing testing tool um, where you have some users, mock users, they are not real users, um, you have some machines, mock machines, not real machines, um, everything is into code, and they are gonna interact with the cloud the same way the real user, the real app, and the real machine are interacting. So then you can build, with this testing tool, you can build uh, your S scenario and your user intents and, and everything to check that the cloud, that the backend is working um, as you expect. Um, and this is um, really an example of how you can do um, with uh, Node.js. So with Node.js, you will use the Cucumber.js framework uh, the request library to make request API request, uh, HTTP request, then the assert library to assert that the value that we could get from um, the service is the value that we want, and a lot of single steps uh, to call the different APIs and make the data transformation with a, a, mo a mock machine, a, a mock user, and 
the interactions that go to the cloud and back. And if you group together all those single steps, then you'll define a scenario or a user journey. In this case, this is the scenario or the user journey, and these are the single steps that you implement calling the API on, on the cloud. And this is how you build an end-to-end -end test. Uh, right. So, what happens? Now, um, let's talk. <laughs> um, forget about the GIF for a moment. Um, let's talk about the problems that testing in production could, could come with. Um, really, uh, testing in production is very useful, so you are uh, very close to, to what the user will, will be doing, and you will, as I, said, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you will realize about all your problems uh, right away, like you had a user next to you uh, blaming you for breaking the system, but if you test too close to, to, to the real user, using the data databases the real users use, uh, the endpoints the real users use, the routes, the services, everything that, the pr production system, pr system actually, um, you might find uh, some issues. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of issues that you might experience. Um, so if you run the end-to-end -end test uh, very often, let's say every minute, you want to check that your service is working uh, every minute, right? And that the user is able to log in every minute so that the, 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 um, the faster you run the end-to-end the, um, the -end test uh, uh, in, in less time, so every minute, um, the sooner you're gonna realize about a problem in production, but that means that you're gonna have a user or several users in the end-to-end -end test uh, trying to call your services and maybe clogging up the services or the databases or um, too many writes, uh, uh, you're gonna um, have to pay more for the writes in DynamoDB, for example. Um, you get a lot of noise and it might slow down your production system if they are not prepared. So you need to find a balance between how often do you want to run the end-to-end -end test and how disruptive are they to your services. Um, so let's say, like an, in the Dyson example, that we have users and machines um, making calls to the cloud every, every second, less than every second. Um, so, the system is under very uh, un under a huge load, and and if you if we write the end-to-end -end test to run every minute, it's going to be even more load, and maybe our services wouldn't be able to cope up with that. So, you need to find a balance between how 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 soon you want to realize that something is failing, and how are you loading your system, your production system, actually. Um, and yet, to, to avoid uh, some issues with, the, with how the users are interacting with your services, um, we can, as, as I mentioned, you, we use mock users and mock machines. So we have virtual users registered in production, like they were real users, but they are not users using the app, but uh, code users that behave like, like real users. Um, yeah, another problem that we have um, is, um, the statistics, when, when the metrics, when you are looking at your services, you have, well, in the last hour, we got 10,000 uh, hits to the service, but if you are running this end-to-end -end test in production, those ten, out of those 10,000, maybe 5,000 are from your, from your test, and it's not easy to discern between the real users and the, and the calls from the test. So, uh, you will get different metrics for the error count, so maybe the end-to-end -end tests are generating errors and you are counting them as user errors, but actually they were only tests. Or for the API usage or the number of users inter interacting with your system, so when you report to your, to your manager and say, oh, we got a million, a million users an hour, maybe a million users is not real because you are running those tests and they are faking the, the data. And, and also, if you are saving your logs for your services, um, you will get mixed logs, so you wouldn't be able to discern which logs uh, are from real users and the errors that the real users are getting, or errors that you generated with the with the end-to-end -end test. So some some ways of uh, getting around that or uh, avoiding those, um, you could use a correlation ID. So 
from your test, every request you make to your services, you label them with a correlation ID so that when you are extracting the metrics, you say, I want all the metrics in my production system except the ones that have this correlation ID so that you can split them out and, and actually focus on, on the real users. You could also do s s the same thing, uh, changing the user agent, for example, on all your API requests um, and using a, a specific user agent or a custom HTTP header so that it's basically how to identify the calls that comes from the end-to-end -end test and that comes from uh, real users. Right, so now you have run the end-to-end -end test, you are happy with them um, and everything is fine. But after some time running the end-to-end the, the -end test, you notice that your service uh, latency is going up, up every single time and, and it was behaving under the second, uh, answering the request under the second, and now it's answering the request uh, in five seconds or taking nine seconds to answer a request and you wonder why if you haven't changed the service or you haven't deployed a new service. Well, it might well be that the end-to-end -end test, the tests that you're running, are continuously adding data to the database. So the database is getting clocked. Um, so now your service, when it's working for real users, needs to query all the data in the database. And as you have a lot of data, now the latency has increased. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you really want to clean up after your testing. Because if you are testing in your development environment, you don't care, right? Because you just tear, tear down the development environment or trash everything. Uh, but you cannot do that in production, so you, you need to be very mindful about uh, cleaning stuff. So um, you need to automatically clean as much, as much data, testing data as possible to avoid that data uh, slowing down your, uh, your production system. Um, the objective here is to leave the system as you found it, as if the test never ran there. So everything, it's, it's your production system, take care of it. Um, yeah, so some, some, some things that could be helpful for, uh, for cleaning up stuff. Um, it helps us start in the test from a clean state. So if you don't, you might as well know that if you don't start the test from a clean state, uh, you might get some uh, failures um, and it's because you are keeping data from a previous test. Uh, so you always need to clean that up. Um, it's also avoiding cluttering for your production databases avoid exhausting other limited resources. Um, and yeah, also when uh, looking at the logs of your application, if you have a lot of end-to-end -end tests, um, it's gonna be more difficult to retrieve and search for specific queries or specific data when maybe troubleshooting some uh, specific users uh, issues. Um, and yeah, so please always clean up after your end-to-end -end test. Um, yeah, so after all I've, I've been through now, uh, you probably have more questions. Um, I'm gonna try to answer them now um, without raising hands so that in the question round, you don't have to ask anything. <laughs> so um, that's interesting. Uh, can the end-to-end -end test pass and you still have problems? Well, no, because the end-to-end -end tests um, are meant to reproduce what real users are doing. So as I showed uh, in a previous slide, we have the end-to-end -end test for the user journey of logging uh, and changing the robot name. Um, if that fails, it means that the system doesn't work. If that pass, it means that the system works. It's, it's just uh, interfacing as a real user, as, as if it were a real user. So um, the answer to this is uh, no. If they are passing, probably, if, and you have written the end-to-end -end test in the right way, um, then you don't have any problem. And the opposite is true, too. Um, so by the nature, end-to-end -end tests span multiple services and teams. Um, so with the, with the example for the login, uh, you could see that it affected the login service, the machine name service, the user registration, and it, it, it went through three different services, right? Um, those different services could be, um, could be uh, different teams could be in charge of those different services. Um, so it, at the end, 
who is responsible for these end-to-end -end tests, who writes them, and who should look at them. So I think this is a, a shared responsibility because, uh, again, this is end-to-end, -end, so it covers all of your services in production, so it affects all teams. So there should be someone looking at those end-to-end -end tests, and then after finding out which part of the production system is really failing, uh, going to that specific team and say, hey, you need to fix it. And also, on collaborating to write them, um, the, the best thing to have is um, the single steps. So for example, user logins, that's one step. Um, the user changed the robot name, that's another step. So you have a lot of small steps, and you can combine those steps as, as you want to build a, a scenario or a user attempt or user journey. Um, so basically, once you have written those small steps, everyone can build their custom scenario. Let's say you want to log in, change uh, the robot name, log out, then log in, then change the robot name again. You can just put those single steps together and build your, your user journey. Um, yeah, how do end-to-end -end tests compare to canary deployments? Uh, do we need both? Well, if you do the canary deployments, you could, uh, you could see if something is not working or, or uh, and it won't, will only affect part of the user base. But the thing with the end-to-end -end test is that you are constantly, constantly testing your services. So it might, might, might uh, work the first time as the example on the, on the returning date function I explained. Uh, but in a couple, uh, in some time from now, it might start failing, and you won't notice that with a canary deployment, um, because it, it might be uh, until uh, several days, months, years after. Um, so yes, you, you need both. And finally, how do you avoid the end-to-end -end test become fragile? With fragile, I mean, that the end-to-end -end tests uh, generate a lot of noise and start failing every single time? Well, if you have written the end-to-end -end test the right way, um, again, what we are trying to do is to simulate how the user interacts with the system. So um, if they are failing, it means that at least one user could get that error too. So your services are not that reliable, and you need to look into that. So if they are fragile, uh, that's probably because your cloud services are not uh, reliable enough. Yes, so to, to do a recap, small recap, um, testing in production is good and necessary. Um, if you are not doing it, you should be looking at it and, and trying to identify how, how best could you test your services so that you realize about the problems before real users do. Think like a new user, act like a new user. Um, you need to, as I explained, you need to try to follow a user journey, how the user will interact with your services, log in, change in the user, the, the robot name, log out, whatever. Cucumber JS is a good start because you can define those single scenarios and, and user journeys. You need to think about your system capacity because uh, it Depends on the system capacity, you run the end-to-end -end test more often or less often. As I said, it might clog up your, your services, so you need to take that in mind. Also, you want to mark the intents to differentiate from the real user's interaction so that you can go to the logs and discern uh, which are uh, from real users and which are from, the, from your test. And obviously, clear your test data and reset the connection or status after each test um, so you don't get caught by any um, fake failure or, or similar. Um, well, it, it was short, <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Um, so uh, before, before I let, uh, I don't know why. Yeah, thank you uh, for coming to my talk. Um, a special thanks to the, to the sponsors, uh, to the organizers of the conference uh, for letting me share uh, my knowledge and, and my experience and for other speakers too. Um, and yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs>